right, there we go. Yay, I'm so excited to be here, um, especially because I really love the Valor software team. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to call them one of our partners uh, with this dot labs, and they're awesome. So it's also a really great place to work. I love seeing uh, the friendliness of it. Uh, there's a bunch of diversity and women there. It's a very welcoming environment. Also, Dima, as you know, some of you in the audience from LF Software know, he's kind of a hard ass too, so you know, you really learn a lot. So highly recommend um, Valor Software in terms of, you know, if you guys are doing anything. So I speak that from the bottom of my heart. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about very exciting things called reactive programming. So I changed up my talk just a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about the magic of reactive programming with RxJS. Um, so how many of you guys have heard of reactive programming? Raise your hands. A few of you, everybody, yeah. This is the Angular community, so I would expect most hands to go up. Um, how many of y'all are actually able to practice it? Another raise of hands. Yeah, so I mean, definitely if you're using NGRX or just doing Angular in general, I should see most of the hands go up. Um, so as, as our wonderful MC said, I am the co-founder of a company called This.Labs. We are uh, based in the US. I'm also a Google developer expert, RxJS core team member. Um, I do community relations at, for Node at the Node Foundation. Uh, I love JavaScript. So whether it's React, Angular, Ember, Vue, whatever, I like to play with that. Um, and I do a lot of other amazing things for the community that excite me. So let's first get into what actually is reactive programming. Because uh, when I first heard this term, I thought, oh, this is something I want to learn. What is this reactive programming? I'm so excited about it. Um, so let's go through the Wikipedia definition of exactly what reactive programming is. Uh, Wikipedia basically says, reactive programming is a programming paradigm concerned with data streams and the propagation of change. This means that it becomes possible to express static or dynamic data streams via ease, uh, with ease via the employed programming language, and that an inferred dependency within the associated execution model exists, which facilitates the automatic propagation of change involved with the data flow. So that's a lot of words, but basically in layman terms, what that means is, okay, reactive programming is just dealing with sets of events over time the automatic or implicit, not explicit, propagation of change. And each step doesn't actually know or care about what the previous step is. It just wants to perform an action to the uh, inputs that are coming in, right? It just wants to react to the incoming change. So if you look at Excel, this is the most basic example of what reactive programming is. What you'll see here is the row one, I have I love programming, A, B, and C. D is just going to concatenate A, B, and C, so it doesn't actually care what's in A, B, or C. You see that in row two because I'm changing C value to reactive programming, and D, again, doesn't care what I have in any of these. It's just concatenating it, and now I have I love reactive programming. So this is the most basic way. Again, it's the implicit propagation of change. Um, so we're gonna talk about a few things today. The first thing we're gonna talk about is reactive programming in standards, and then we're gonna talk about how we see it in frameworks and libraries as well. How to think reactively, which is one of the biggest challenges uh, when trying to do reactive programming. Uh, we'll talk about what RxJS is, um, and how reactive programming really makes your life a lot easier, and why you should actually start investing your time in it. So we'll first talk about reactive programming in standards. Um, so in the past few years, we've seen standards bodies like TC39 or what would begin to consider and adopt reactive programming paradigms. Um, in TC39, you have promises and observable, and in what way you have the event target observable proposal. So <clears throat> let's go into promises first. Um, so promises were added to browsers around 2014, very recent actually, um, added to Node around 2015, um, and included in the official ES2015 spec. They're push-based, single value, they're always async, eager, stateful, they have a really simple base API, and you have a simple transformation options, right, like then and catch. Now, it's reactive because it allows you to process a value asynchronously and in steps through then blocks, right? So you can see here I'm just using the fetch, fetch API to fetch a JSON file, 
And then I'm uh, chaining together promises to parse a JSON file into a JavaScript object. And then I'm just console logging uh, to signal that I've completed the parsing um, and that I have fruit snacks. Uh, and a lot of people, when they look at promises, don't actually realize it's reactive. And the reason is because most of the code you write to interact with promises isn't reactive. But in the promises in themselves are. Then if we look at the uh, observable and the TC39 observable proposal, this is currently at stage one. You can check it out on GitHub. Um, RxJS is a reference implementation of the TC39 observable proposal. It has a simple base API, it's push based, um, multiple values, can be synchronous or asynchronous, generally, state, generally stateless, and also has many transformation options out of the box via the abstraction RxJS. Now, uh, if this is the most basic way, uh, or one of, an example of how to use RxJS. So here what I'm just doing is using the Ajax utility from RxJS to get the JSON file, fruit snacks, and then I'm subs subscribing to that JSON file so that I can emit the values from that observable. Um, observables are lazy, so it doesn't actually request the file until you call subscribe, which is kind of awesome. And then I'm going ahead and console logging fruit snacks. Event target observable proposal. This is something rather new. Um, ben Lesh proposed it in December on behalf of Google, and what it does is, if it were implemented, would uh, add a method called on to event target. Um, it will come with a few operators as well, like map, filter, first, and take until, and you can check that out on GitHub as well. But again, this is in an action. It's pretty simple, so if you just call an, uh, the on method with an event type as the argument, it gives you back an observable of those events. So here I'm just using the button element, calling on, and then passing in click events as the argument, and that's just gonna give me back an observable of click events, uh, which would be so cool. Um, so that's a little bit about reactive programming, and again, what we're seeing in different standards bodies. But let me talk about something that is uh, a little bit more applicable to what you're currently doing in your jobs, which is reactive programming in different frameworks and libraries. So I'm gonna go through a few examples and talk through D3, Angular, Vue, and React and sort of where we see these reactive programming paradigms. Um, but the, the cool part about it is, you know, reactive programming, we all do it in our everyday lives. So uh, D3, for example, is a great example of this, you know, D3 is reactive programming, but they didn't actually, you know, start off, start off and say, hey, I'm gonna build a reactive library. Um, the code example you see here, it's very declarative, which is really cool. This is kind of one of the things that's awesome about reactive programming, but the declarative nature of it doesn't actually make it reactive, um, but I like how you can kind of sort of like reason about what's happening. Um, it's reactive because you're reacting to the propagation of change, right? And you're changing a value's location or the way it looks, but you're not explicitly doing so on every single event. You're just sort of describing what you want to happen and then it happens under the hood. Um, Angular, well, Angular and RxJS are basically besties, which is awesome. So I love that the Angular team has really invested in RxJS and been able to really reap the benefits of reactive programming through that. Because of course we have EdgeRx, um, but other ways that um, Angular really benefits from reactive programming is the fact that they decided early on to make RxJS a first class citizen in Angular. It's actually the only external dependency of Angular and of course Ben Lesh just joined the Angular team. So you can still use it in every framework and library, but it's nice that the Angular team is actually supporting uh, RxJS. Uh, if you all have used the on push change to text the strategy, um, this is one of the ways uh, that Angular benefits from RxJS. So when you enable this, it provides more efficient and performant data flow because it'll push changes at you versus waiting to detect changes. Uh, Angular router as well, pretty cool that you can just get an observable of various events around activated routes. Example of this might be changes to rep parameters or query parameters and forms as well. Um, all validation events are reactive, so that allows your asynchronous and synchronous validation to blend together really nicely. And there's obviously a lot of other really cool ways uh, we benefit in Angular from reactive programming. But I'll talk about React as well. So uh, in React, I love it because sometimes I talk about RxJS and they say, oh yeah, it's React, right? No. 
But if you look at React, um, simply calling set state in React, it will trigger a re-render of that component, right, and, and any of its children. Um, yes, it, it might be a little bit of a stretch, and a lot of people say, no, this is not true, because this is actually pull-based, but that's a very common misconception. Reactive programming does not have to be push-based. It can be pull-based as well. So if you look at how set state propagates change, um, the idea of itself, again, in itself is technically reactive. If you look at Redux Observable as well, by the way, this logo was designed by um, Ben Lesh and Jay Phelps, but um, it's for Redux, so it's three decks. Cool, right? <laughs> but um, Redux Observable basically uses RxJS to declaratively handle your business logic and your side effects when you're using something like Redux. MobX, um, I don't know if any of you have tried to use MobX with Angular, but in the React community, um, MobX is probably a little bit more popular and it makes your React application or any other you know, any other application full-blown reactive programming. Um, your state just basically becomes this one giant reactive model. Um, and again, this is a very good example of something being pull-based but also reactive. Um, so what it will do is it'll, it'll push a notification at you, but you need to pull the values out to actually calculate the value. View as well, if any of you guys have <coughs> explored view, excuse me. <coughs> If any of you all have explored Vue, um, I tend to use uh, RxJS raw inside my Vue applications, um, but they did create this really awesome uh, library that sort of wraps RxJS to make things more Vue-like, so you can definitely check that out as well. The point I want to get here by sharing with you sort of where we see reactive programming in different frameworks and libraries is, again, it's just a, uh, and I was actually kind of disappointed when I learned this, because I thought I was gonna learn something so cool but it's just a fancy term for everything we all do, right? Like, no one invented it, it's just a, a name for the pattern of declaratively reacting um, to the propagation of change. So, cool, but also like, it's basic. So, we typically see patterns, uh, reactive programming patterns, appear when there's a very natural fit for events to be modeled as values over time. So great examples of this would be web sockets, user events, animations, HTTP requests, uh, network connections, file system changes, etc. So we talked a little bit about the frameworks and libraries, sure, but then um, another big hurdle that people really, uh, and I'm sure if you guys have messed around with NGRX or RxJS, um, the thinking reactively is something that you sort of need to train your mind to do. Um, and let's talk about that first. So um, in order to approach reactive programming, uh, you need to think, think reactively, right? So you should be thinking of everything being modeled as an event, the idea that all web applications are actually event-driven, and everything, meaning any variable updated by an event, can basically be represented as a set of values over time, even those events. I think uh, this is one of the biggest hurdles, this everything can be represented as a set of values over time, even events. Some people might say, well, isn't this just streams? And yes, sure it is, but there's too many words to describe what we do in programming. So let's go ahead and first define what I mean by set, when I say set of values over time. Um, so the definition of a set is basically set in the math sense, right? So A, B, and C. And, and what we're trying to do is, the, in, in the current mindset of programming, when an action happens, typically you think, okay, when an action happens, one thing happened. But if you have a new mindset and you start treating um, events as sets of values, right, then that's how you start thinking reactively. Example sets might be an empty set, set of zero, or the normal set you would typically think about. And if you start doing this and treating everything as a set of values, you can all of a sudden start doing so much more with your data. You can query it, map it, filter it, you can join and combine it in different ways. Um, you can give something half a set of things or uh, things with a set of parameters, right? And, and a lot of different options open up for you in your code. So hopefully that helps you sort of start thinking like, okay, this is how I should start thinking about my applications. Um, but next I just want to talk about RxJS, right? We all know what RxJS is, but I wanted to give a more uh, defined definition of what RxJS is. So um, again, there's a lot of different implementations around reactive programming paradigms, um, but RxJS is special because it's a domain-specific language for reacting to events and it actually sits on top of JavaScript. So when you learn something like RxJS, which is why I think it's very valuable that you guys get to learn this as Angular developers, you know, so you're sort of kind of forced into it. 
um, is because you can take that knowledge anywhere, whether you're doing React, uh, Vue, Node, anything like that. This knowledge of being able to learn and understand RxJS is, um, you know, it's framework agnostic, right? It's also the most popular reactive programming library. So currently between RxJS 4 and 5, there's over 12 million monthly downloads on NPM, which is super cool. Um, there's also other dialects. So whether it's uh, Java, PHP, .NET, Ruby, etc., there's typically a, a sister of RxJS. Um, and I think that's also really cool because if you're working with backend developers and they're using, let's say, rx.net on the back end, um, you can communicate with them a little bit better because you kind of understand their code and they kind of understand your code a little bit more. Um, then let's talk about, um, there's kind of three different things that break down RxJS. So you have um, observables, you have observers, and you have different operators, right? So let's first talk about what an observable is and how observers actually work with them. Um, so imagine that observables are basically just functions. It sort of makes it a little bit simpler to think about, right? So here what we have is we have our imaginary observable that's represented as a function called my observable. And the way we call our imaginary observable is by passing in an observer object uh, with callback handlers on it. The next method is called when an observable wants to emit values. And the error method is called when there's a problem or an error condition. Um, and then when the observable is actually done emitting values, it signals that it's done emitting by calling complete. Since our imaginary observable is basically just a function, if we want to use it, all we have to do is call it with an observer object. And it could also just return a teardown function to clean itself up as well. So then the question is, all right, well, if it's just like functions, why not just use functions? Well, it's because RxJS um, can handle some of the stuff that functions can't handle for you. And so this really helps improve the developer experience and just makes your life a lot easier. Um, like, for example, with functions, you might accidentally call methods out of order, right? You'd never want to uh, call a um, next after a complete, for example, right? Observables will actually protect you from things like this. Um, if you're just using functions, you're always going to have to check if there is a teardown returned or not. Um, and you always have to provide a next error complete because the function expects them. So in this case, the function would actually error out because we haven't provided the complete method. Um, and you always have to call the teardown function on error and complete as well. So what you can do though, and this is why RxJS is awesome, is you can basically just take this function and then you can just wrap it in a class that handles it for you. So here what we're doing is we're just wrapping a function in an observable constructor, which is the most basic way to create an observable. Um, if you've looked at RxJS, the library, and there's a, a bunch of different helpers to help you create observables, everything just uses the observable constructor under the hood. So if you get stuck, just do this, it's totally fine. Um, the observable class will actually normalize all the behavior for you automatically. So it's gonna make sure that the observer um, you get always has a next error and complete, right? Um, and it'll also make sure that when you call error and complete that uh, it calls any teardown function that you provided as well. And again, instead of having to do it uh, manually and calling it directly. Now, what you could do after you've wrapped uh, the function in an observable constructor is you could just call subscribe and the observer will give you uh, the methods next error and complete to emit values. So you, hear, you see here I'm calling next to emit the values, um, but the cool thing is, even though I'm not providing an error or a complete, again, it automatically provides it for me anyway. So much less typing and many more guarantees, which is super awesome. Um, I think the other great thing, and this is like the unsexy thing we have to deal with, but um, about observable is that when you call unsubscribe, it actually tears everything down for you and handles cleaning up any memory management. So. Memory management is not a fun thing to talk about, but it's really cool that it just does it for you. Um, so this is just to illustrate again that observables are just like functions, but they just come with a lot of really cool guarantees that just make your life so much easier. Um, now, the second thing people sort of wonder is, okay, well, what's an operator, right? Um, an operator basically just helps you transform one observable into another. So. Uh, we're already familiar with methods like filter and map that we can use in 
uh, on arrays in JavaScript. Um, and these are very similar to what operators are in RxJS. So here's what it would look like to use the um, map and fill, uh, RxJS's map and filter operators in your code. So all I'm doing here is I'm just creating an observable of numbers, and then I'm using the map and filter operators, um, and then I'm just subscribing um, to the observable with the observer and emitting the values that the observable from that observable and logging out on, onto the console. So operators are super cool, right? Um, and it's really cool that RxJS basically just does all of this stuff for you. But if you wanted to look under the hood and figure out how operators are implemented, um, this is a simple map operator implementation if you were to create it for yourself. Um, and I'll walk through that code really quickly. So basically, all we're doing here is we're taking a simple um, an observable and returning a new observable. And then we're subscribing to it instead of calling it like we would a function. And then what we're doing here is we're just passing along the transformed value and emitting the value by calling observer.next. Um, and of course, with observers, you automatically get methods error and complete if you need them. Um, and again, the other cool thing about RxJS is there's over 60 operators. I'm sure uh, all of y'all have been overwhelmed, like, which operator do I use? Um, but the other cool thing is you probably won't ever actually have to implement an operator on your own. So here's a few popular operators um, that you can start with. Um, I really like share replay. If anybody sees that before, it's my favorite operator. So we talked a little bit about, again, what RxJS is, but then we get to the fun stuff, which is, okay, well, how can reactive programming actually make my life easier, right? Um, so I'm gonna walk through a few different examples. Um, with RxJS, you can just do a lot of cool things with just so much less code, which is awesome. So drag and drop, for example, which is a hard problem to solve uh, well in Angular, could actually be really easy. Um, here I have a grumpy cat game. Let's see if it actually plays. Okay, yay. Okay, so my grumpy cat game, um, you know, I'm just dragging and dropping, and then basically if grumpy cat likes the things I feed, then I get a point, and if grumpy cat doesn't, then grumpy cat gets a point. So you can see that Grumpy Cat basically won. But again, I just wanted to illustrate how easy drag and drop was, and then walk through that code to show you how few lines of code it actually takes. Um, let me go back to this. I think I can. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here I'm just doing my normal import for Angular, and then just importing a few things uh, from ArxJS, like from event and subscription, New version of RxJS um, basically started from like 5.5 five and up. Now it's currently at 6. Point something. Um, but it's made, <laughs> import's way easier. So uh, I'm just importing things like from event and subscription here. And then I'm just importing all the different operators um, I need to use for my, map, for my uh, application. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about some of these things because we're a little bit short on time. But I just wanna give you an idea of how to uh, implement something like drag and drop and again, how it can be accomplished easily. So here again, I'm just doing a little bit of setup. So I'm just creating uh, new subjects that I'll be using in my code. So I have a mouse down, mouse move, mouse up, right, for the, for, for, for the drag and drop. And then I'm defining subscription rule, which we will use later. Um, here's where it gets exciting. So I'm just creating a target mouse down here, and I'm filtering it based on any element that has the food emoji on it. Uh, Google Slides doesn't like emojis, but basically filter any target that matches the food emoji, right? Um, and then I'm saying that for any of those targeted mouse downs, I'm creating another observable of mouse drags to make that element draggable. And finally, I'm making that element draggable until there is a mouse up by using the take until operator. So take until there's a mouse up right there. Um, and then I'm creating a new subscription when the component initializes and subscribing to the mouse drag observable. Um, and then when I'm dragging, I'm basically changing the style so that it actually drags on the screen. And then when the component unmounts, I'm making sure to clean up my subscription by unsubscribing. Um, some of y'all might say like, well, we could make this more angular which we totally could, but in my case, uh, it's much more efficient to just update the DOM directly. So here's my HTML in case you are curious. Um, again, Google Slides doesn't love emojis, but each one of the images has the little food emoji that I use. So each one of these images is actually the ones that are actually draggable. Um, yeah, 
And again, here it is in action. I always, you know, especially for talks, I always wonder, like, what am I going to build that interests me right now? And this one did for this case. So you can see that, and I will go ahead and change my map. It's cute, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> so um, something probably a little bit more complex, that was a very easy example, um, that's made super easy with RxJS is doing something like multiplexing over a WebSocket. Um, so, uh, when I was telling people that I was going to do this, they were like, most people don't really know what that means, Tracy, and I said, really? Oh, okay. Well, uh, multiplexing in our case is basically when you're sending and receiving uh, multiple independent requests um, and responses concurrently over the same WebSocket. So, why do you need to multiplex? Basically, um, it helps reduce the amount of overhead of opening multiple WebSockets when you're doing things like receiving real-time updates between the client and the server, or if you want to do something like continuous streaming, this is a really great uh, way to handle that. So here you can see I created this application. Uh, how many of y'all know Ken Wheeler? I mean, Ken Wheeler, okay. Some people, we love Ken. He represents America right now, which I don't know how I feel about that. But. Uh, but anyways, you can follow Ken Wheeler on Twitter. But you can see Ken here. And here I have an application, uh, which uh, it doesn't love me sometimes, so. But anyways, okay, so let me, let me show you the, um, let's see, how am I gonna be able to do that? Let's see. Give me one second. I always love it when demos don't work. <laughs> Hold on, I got it. Go ahead and drag that over. Are you going to drag for me? No, you're not. <sighs> okay. Let's see if I can drag you over. Well, I'm really sad that this isn't working so well, but there we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I have an app. The reason why I'm showing this to you in React Native, which is, this, this app is written in React Native, is because, again, with RxJS, it doesn't matter what language you write it in, right? Like, 80 or 90% of your code is just copy-pasting into whatever framework a flavor of a month is. So I did this in React Native, but it's so easy to re-implement this in something like Native Script or Ionic or, or, um, or Angular. Okay, so I'm gonna play my little demo, and what you'll see is, right, I have a little button, and I'm adding a little Ken bubble. So like Ken is jiggling, right? And um, so every time I click that button, it sends a request to my WebSocket server. And each one of Ken's heads actually represents an individual request from the server. It's very abstract, I know. And every little shake of Ken's head actually represents a new value being pushed to me from the server over one WebSocket connection. Um, so as you can see, there's like a lot of requests uh, being multiplexed um, between the client and the server. And um, Ken's head only appears for a short bit because in my code I've used um, the timer observable to set it to three seconds. Uh, before the observable is going to complete and unsubscribe from itself. But, you know, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, the, those are all like individual requests over one WebSocket. Pretty awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this big again and move on, and I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the code. So here, all I'm doing again is, um, I'm doing a few imports I need to do. Probably the most exciting is you see that I'm importing WebSocket from RxJS, and what WebSocket is, is basically just the WebSocket API wrapped in a subject, and it provides conveniences, or conveniences around WebSocket for you. Um, okay, so going through the code again, super easy, because uh, all I'm doing is just creating an initial state of random Kens, which is just an object that we're gonna treat as a dictionary to look up random Ken heads uh, by ID, and then we're making a WebSocket subject, um, which is lazy, so it's not going to actually uh, create the WebSocket in the browser until we actually subscribe to it. 
Um, and then we have a request can head function, and then every time we call it, it's gonna send a message through to the server, uh, through that WebSocket, and request a can head, all right? And then we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and use that request can head later um, when we click that button, which you all saw. Now, uh, when the component mounts, that's actually when we're gonna go ahead and set up our WebSocket and listen to the responses. And we know that the server is gonna send us can heads by ID, so whenever we request a can head, we're gonna get a unique ID back for that particular request. Um, the server is actually going to continuously give us a stream of can heads by ID with animation coordinates for that particular can head. Um, and what we also want to do is we want to make sure to group uh, those so that we have individual streams for each can head uh, that we request. And we can you do this by using the group by operator. And then when we uh, request a can head, we're going to get a new stream for each particular can head. And that stream is just going to animate. Um, and that stream, of, sorry, that stream of animation coordinates uh, will animate the head for just about three seconds and using that time, timer and circle right there and take it to as well. Okay, and then what we wanna do is we just wanna clean that up and remove that can head after three seconds. And we can do that by using the finalize operator. Um, and now that we have a stream of can heads, we can subscribe to it and at this point it's gonna kick off the WebSocket. And every time we get a response back, we're gonna update our dictionary by setting state and if this component unmounts, we just want to make sure we tear down that WebSocket by calling unsubscribe as well. Um, so now that we have a map of random can heads and we want to get all the values from that, we're going to go ahead and use object values, which will give us an array of those can values. Um, and when we have an array of can heads, then we can just loop over that uh, for each can head we create. Um, and it's going to create an image based on that, uh, based on the X and Y coordinates that we actually receive from the server. So every time we re-render, we could actually be adding a new image or we could be updating an existing image that was already there. And of course, uh, the button, you can see a little button right there, um, is, how, uh, is where we're using our request can head function to request a can head. So yeah, hopefully that was interesting. Um, I have all this code on GitHub, by the way, so you can uh, pull it down and play with it. Um, but a summary of, hopefully, uh, the things that I taught you guys today is just getting an idea of where you see reactive programming in different standards. So looking at promises, observable, uh, event target observable, and different things like that. And then uh, reactive programming in different frameworks and libraries, right? Um, where you see the different patterns. So hopefully as you code now, you'll sort of like start seeing these different patterns um, in your everyday lives. And how to think reactively, right? This is a very important thing to sort of start wrapping your mind around. And if you start coding this way, um, your application and the reactivity of your different applications is gonna get so much better. Uh, we talked about also uh, what RxJS is. So what's an observable, how to think about it, um, how observers work with observables, and then what operators are and how they work under the hood. Um, and finally, we went through a few examples um, that I hope shows you how abstractions like RxJS can really make development life a lot easier. Um, one thing to remember is you don't actually need to Rx all the things, so don't feel like all of a sudden you're gonna have to go and refactor all the things in your application. You can just dip your toe in and you can use it on click handlers, AJAX requests, um, it allows really easy cancellation for that, anything asynchronous, or you know, which I'm sure some of you have done already, like you can just call subscribe and just do your normal imperative code and it's completely fine. Um, I, uh, being a part of the RxJS core team, the main thing I do is help lead the RxJS docs initiative. Um, so you can come contribute and it's a great way to learn by creating real world examples for us. And it's a very easy library to contribute to. So find me, like tag me on GitHub, tell me you need help, I'm always there for you. Um, so thank you so much. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Lee. I'm super happy to answer any questions related to RxJS or anything else. Um, and um, that's the Grumpy Cat game in Angular, and then that's the React Native app. And this is the Node uh, WebSocket server that was written for that. So like that's actually probably a good thing for everyone to look at as well. So thank you so much.